Hi, my name's Luke. I'm going to go through Leaving the Cert at Higher Level Maths Paper 1, Section A from 2022 in this video. Uh, as I go, I will uh, reference the marking scheme, which you can find online, and I'll also be using these um, tables. Okay, so let's get started. Um, here's a question one, uh, which is an algebra question. And what we have here is we have um, this quadratic equation. Okay, I have a habit of sort of rewriting the question just um, after I start. And we want to find a value for this m here, which we don't know, so that the um, so the quadratic equation has exactly one solution. So what they're talking about here is some quadratic equation, which will be like a U shape, which will sort of dip down and like touch the axis in, in just one position. And, you know, so we know that we're gonna have to sort of find out, you know, find roots and things like this. Often that means, you know, factorizing, uh, getting, you know, the X's here, X's here and X's here and so on and getting to, to the, the, the two roots, but that's not going to be an option in this case because uh, we don't know what this m is. So what we're going to use here is the quadratic formula. So if we have a quadratic equation which is given to you in this form here, then the quadratic formula is as follows. Okay, and if we want the quadratic equation to have just this one root, you see this plus or minus piece here, we need this, well, what's after the plus or minus this thing here, we need this to be zero. And how is that zero? That zero if b squared minus four ac is equal to zero. Now here, a is equal to three, b is equal to minus m, and c is equal to three. Okay, and if we want b squared minus four ac equal to zero, it's the same as saying minus m squared, minus four times a, which is three, times c, which is three, equal to zero. So we need m squared minus, and then this is four times nine, which is 36 equal to zero, which is the same as saying that m squared is equal to 36, and this will give us two values for m. m is equal to uh, six, or m is equal to minus six. Okay, so this was a quadratic equation, but you know we weren't able to use this factorization method, so we had to use the quadratic formula over here. And then this is something that we should know about quadratic formulas, this one here. Okay, so now the next time, next one we have to explain why uh, this has no real solution. Now there's two ways to do it. The first and probably the easiest way to do it might be just to multiply it all out, and then you know uh, use the quadratic formula. Uh, and, and see what happens. Okay, so if I multiply this out, it'll be 2x plus 3 by 2x plus 3 plus 7. And that'll be like 4x squared. Okay, then 2 by 6. So it'll be this times this, this times this, this times this, and this times this. So uh, 2x times 3 will be 6x. 3 times 2x will be another 6x. So that's 12x. And then plus 9 plus 7 is equal to 0. <clears throat> and so I have 4x squared. Um, plus 12x plus 13 equal to zero. And then looking at the quadratic formula again, <coughs> if I have ax squared plus bx plus c equal to zero, um, then x is equal to minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Now, if this here inside of the square root, if this is negative, because we can't get the square root of a negative number, there's no number so that no real number that when you square it that you get a negative number. Um, so if this if we're not going to get real roots, we would need b squared minus four ac, which is the thing that's underneath the square root. We need this to be less than zero. Okay, so we're going to check that a is equal to four, b is equal to twelve, and c is equal to thirteen. That means that b squared minus four ac is equal to twelve squared minus four times four times 13, which is 144 minus, let me get my calculator, four times four times 13, which is equal to 208. And this is less than zero, so this means no real roots. 
Okay, so that's one way to do it. There is a simpler way to do it by looking at the form that this quadratic equation is given to us in. And the first thing to realize is if we were going to square all of this stuff out, you know, we would get a quadratic equation like we had before, but uh, it's going to have a plus in front of the x squared bit, right? So that means it's going to be a u shape, right? And that means with a u shape, it's going to have this minimum value at the bottom. Okay, so that's the first thing to notice. The second thing to notice is that this first term in this quadratic equation, so the first term in the quadratic equation, this is always greater than or equal to zero, right? Because of the square. So if you square something, you always make it positive. But that means that this seven here, you see this first thing is always gonna add on to the second thing. So this means that seven is the minimum value that this function takes. And so when we draw this here, this minimum value is at seven. And so this U-shaped curve, you know, so basically we can conclude this is a U-shaped parabola. Um, and also that seven is the minimum minimum value. So that means as well that there is no real solution. The problem doesn't cross over the x axis. So that's the other way to do that. The next question, okay, show that x is equal to minus one is not a solution of this thing here. Well, all we have to do is just sub it in. So we just put it in three times minus one all squared plus two times minus one plus five is equal to zero. Now notice that I always put in when I'm subbing in. I put things in in brackets, it just helps you not make mistakes. So that's three times one, which is then three, plus two times minus uh, one, which is minus two, plus five is equal to, and that's gonna be eight minus two is equal to six, which is not equal to zero. So that means that X is equal to minus one is not a solution of this quadratic equation. The next thing it says, is find the remainder when 3x squared plus 2x plus 5 is divided by x plus 1. Now, just a quick side note, 2 divides into 8 4 times remainder 0, and but 2 divides into 9 4 times remainder 1. So when we do, uh, you know, dividing this uh, linear into a quadratic, we're going to do it in exactly the same way. Okay? So I'm going to take uh, what we're given here. We have to do x plus 1 divided into 3x squared plus 2x plus 5, okay? So how to do these, these um, how to do these um, um, divisions. Um, so we're going to put a number here, and that's going to multiply down by this one here so that we end up with a 3x squared here, okay? So we have to look at this here and decide what, what that has to be. And uh, that's going to have to be 3x. So 3x will multiply by that x there to give us 3x squared. But then we also have to multiply it by this one here, 3x. And we just put the x squares under the x and the x under the x, uh, like so. And now we're going to change the signs, okay? So not make them minus, change the signs. So if they're minus, make them plus. And then we get a 0 here, and then we end up with minus x here, and then we're going to carry down that 5. And now what we do is we repeat that process. So we look here. We have to put a number here that multiplies here to give us a minus x here. Okay, what does that have to be? Well, it has to be um, a minus 1. So minus 1 will multiply by that x and give us a minus x, and mi minus 1 will multiply by that 1 to give me minus 1. And now I change the signs, plus and plus, and then I end up with a 6. So in exactly the same way as over here, we could say that, you know, 9 is equal to 2 by 4, remainder 1, we can now say that this thing, 3x squared plus 2x plus 5, is equal to this thing, x plus 1, times this thing, 3x minus 1 plus a 6. And we're done. Remember, just, you know, put a nice box around the answer so that it's clear for the examiner. Okay, I want to talk now about the marking scheme for question 1. And in the marking scheme, um, they have basically all of these um, uh, uh, partial credits that they award, right? So when it's um, uh, when it's a, a question that's marked out of ten, for example, you can get this high credit for a seven, or a high credit for an eight, or when it's marked out of fifteen, you can get this high credit for a twelve. And the point is that. So for this question here, question 1a, you can see that you can get this high credit of 7. 
And it's really worthwhile to look at what it is that you need to do to get that high credit of seven, because very often it actually is, um, you can get this very, very quickly. Like for example, if you get two steps correct in doing this question, so you would have to write down like, you know, for example, we'd have to realize that we need b squared minus 4ac to be equal to zero. And then we just uh, sub in correctly. If we do those two things without getting the right answer, we're going to get 70% of the marks for this question. Um, and, uh, you know, because what might happen is that the actual working out might take the majority of the time and the and the, the kind of the kind of key to doing the question can be done like on the first you know, a couple of lines or something like that. So, you know, uh, you know, if we got one, another example is just getting one of the values. So like if we had M is equal to six and we missed this one, we would still get seven marks out of 10. Uh, in part B, uh, the scale goes zero to five. So there's no high partial credit. There's only this uh, mid credit. And in part C, the high partial credit is 12. And we get that for having one completely Correct. And then they say substantial work of merit in part two. So, you know, we have to get one correct or else we can't get that high mark. But then, you know, it's a little bit vague how they say it. But if you make the indication to the examiner that you know that this is what you have to do, but you mess up below, you're still going to get 12 marks out of 15. And that's, you know, that's quite a lot. You know, you could do a question and think that you messed it up completely, but actually you've gotten most of the marks. Okay, so now we have to in integrate this function here. So um, now when we're integrating here, I'm just going to go over here into the tables and just bring up that section. It's always handy if you know what type of question you're being asked um, to you know bring up the appropriate section in, in the tables. And we see this one here. And the rule that we're going to use is this top rule here. So if we're integrating something that is x to the power of n, we increase the power by 1. So just add one to the power and then divide by whatever your power is. Now note that if you have like x, we think about x as x to the power of one. Or if you have like, you know, number one, we think about number one as x to the power of zero. Okay, so increasing this one here would go to like x squared, but then divided by two. And then increasing this one here would go x to the power of one divided by one. And when we look here, we see we have a two, a five, and a six constants, and we're just going to ignore them. Like we, we keep them, but they don't do anything. So the integral of g of x dx is equal to the integral of two x squared plus five x plus six uh, dx. And then this gives us, uh, well, so this x squared here becomes, well, the two is staying there. So x squared goes to x cubed over three plus 5x squared over 2, so this x goes to x squared over 2, then plus 6x. And there are two different forms of integration. There's going to be um, definite and indefinite. So when we don't have these little numbers here, it's indefinite integration, and we're going to have to add on a plus c, basically, in that case. So I'm not going to go through all the details of everything here. I can. Um, um, if, if there are specific questions, then I can, you can leave a comment below and I can make a, a video on that if there's enough um, requests. Now, if you're ever wondering if you're right, right with your, your integration, you're able to check, right? So if we were to take this thing here, we can check if we're right where, with our integration by differentiating. So if we differentiated this, and you don't have to do this, this is just an extra little bit. 2 times 3x squared over 3, and the 3 is cancel, plus 5 times 2x over 2, and the twos cancel plus six, and then x goes to one, and then the c is gone. And you see, this is what we started with, so we know that we're right with that. Now, if you forget that plus c, you're going to you're going to lose a mark. Okay, the next question. Um, so we have this integration question, and just to just to remind you that if you take the um, if you take the integral of a curve, so if you have some curve like so, and then you've got these points a and b. If you take the integral between a and b of this curve, then you get the area between the curve and the x-axis. Okay, so that's uh, we're going to be using that here. Okay, um, so in this question, um, we're given that um, there's a function, which is this one here. It's just ax squared plus bx plus c. So we don't know what a, a b, and c are yet. Probably we're going to be asked. And there's these three regions, K, L, and N. 
and they're bounded by the x-axis, the graph of f of x, and two, and and, the, and each of them are bounded by two vertical lines. So what does that mean? That means that the x-axis and uh, the the curve, see, they they sort of act like a kind of a fence or a wall, right? So that means that these regions are between those two. And if we take k, for example, this one here, well, it's bounded by the x-axis, it's bound by this one, it's bound by this one. So that, that's what gives us that part there. And the same is true for, for L and for N. Okay, now we're told that the area of this region here, so this is the region K, the, the area of that is 538 uh, square units. And um, okay, so, so um, now we have to show, uh, since we know that it's 538 square units, we have to use integration of f of x to show that this is true. Okay, so what does what does that mean? So we're going to integrate f of x uh, dx, and we're going to do this for the region k, right? So that means that well, we want to look at these limits for 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 integration. So this region k, it goes from zero on the x-axis to two on the x-axis. So we go ahead and we integrate these two. Uh, sorry, integrate this function from zero to two. Um, and <clears throat> when we do that, we, we get, okay, uh, well, we keep the a, and then a, we, that becomes x cubed over three, and then this is b times x squared over two plus c times x. And I'm gonna put that now into um, square brackets and put, the, put uh, these limits on here, zero and two. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that this now is equal to you take the two and you sub it in in place of x here, and then you put the zero and you sub it in place of x here, and then you subtract the first one from the second one. So we're going to take that same thing again, a times two cubed over three plus b times two squared over, over two plus c times two, minus the same thing but with zero subbed in. And when you know when zero is everywhere, I don't really care. So c times zero because this is all going to work out to be zero. So this ends up being, well, 4a, uh, sorry, not, um, it's going to be 8a over 3 plus, well, one of these two is cancelled, plus 2b plus 2c. And that's now equal to the area, which is 538, 30, sorry, 538. So what I'm going to do is cross multiply by the 3, first of all. So I'll get 8a plus 6b plus 6c is equal to 1,614. And we can see we can divide a 2 into everything. So divide both sides by 2, we get 4a plus 3b plus 3c, and then 1,614 divided by 2 is going to be 807. So as required. Now the next part, uh, the area of the three regions, k, l, and n, um, give the following three equations and then solve these equations for for a b and c now this question here if the previous question was about integration and we'd be nearly tempted to think that this question is about integration but actually this is just a simultaneous equation uh, question and the question is just to find the values of a b and c so what we're going to do is we're going to label the first equation one the second equation two and the third equation three we have to pick two of these, cancel out a variable, and then get another equation, pick another two, cancel out a variable. And when we look at the variable that we want to cancel, I'm going to cancel the Cs for a couple of reasons. We can see that they have the same number in front, so it's going to be, we don't have to multiply an equation by anything. And also for the Bs and the As, um, you know, the numbers are quite larger, right? So if you were to multiply one line by another, you know, you'd be multiplying 76 maybe by, and that's sort of, you always make mistakes when the larger the numbers are. So you want to keep the numbers as, as, as small as possible. So uh, I'm going to try to cancel out C, right? So how do I do that? Well, I take equation one and equation two, and I'm simply going to, let me multiply equation one by, um, multiply equation one by, by uh, minus one. So you multiply equation one by minus one. Then we would get minus four A, minus 3b minus 3c is equal to minus 807 and then equation 2 we just leave that as it is 9b and then plus 3c is equal to 879 and then when we cancel these okay that'll be 24a this will be plus 6b and then 879 uh, minus 
807 is then 72. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide across by 6 and I'll get 4a plus b is equal to and 72 divided by 6 then is equal to 12. And I'm going to call this equation 4 and just label it nicely like that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And now I'm going to repeat the same process. And why not take equation 1 and equation 3 this time and again multiply equation 1 by minus 1. So that's minus 4a minus 3b minus 3c is equal to minus 807 and then 76a plus 15b uh, plus 3c is equal to 663 and now I'm going to add these two together so um, here I'll get 72a here I'll get plus 12b and then they'll cancel and then 800 and um, a, sorry uh, it's going to be 663 minus 807 is going to be equal to minus 144 and if I look at these three numbers here I can see that they're actually divisible by 12 so 72 divided by 12 is 6a plus b is equal to and then uh, 100 minus 144 divided by 12 is equal to minus uh, 12 and we're going to call this equation here equation 5 okay so now if I take equation 4 and 5 together I'm just going to bring them onto a new page we can see now that we can simply um, subtract one from the other right so I can simply subtract or I could multiply minus one by this one then this would be a minus this would be a minus and this would be a plus now I add them that means that 10a is equal to sorry not 10a um, minus 2a is equal to 24 so a is equal to minus 12 and uh, if I now sub that value of minus 12 back in here I've got 4 times minus 12 plus b is equal to 12 so that's going to be minus 48 plus b is equal to 12 so that means that b has to be equal to um, 12 plus 48 so b is equal to 60 so here we go b is equal to 60 and then if we take those two values and we sub them now into equation 1 so this is equation 1 here and we take those two values and we sub them in so 4 times minus 12 plus 3 times uh, 60 plus 3 times c is equal to 807 so that's going to be minus 48 uh, plus 180 plus 3c equal to well that's going to be um, sorry 132 plus 3c equal to 807 that means that 3c is equal to 807 minus 100 807 minus 132 which is 675 and that makes c equal to 675 divided by 3 which is then 225 so i have my answer then that a is equal to minus 12 b is equal to 60 and c is equal to 225. Don't, don't worry if your answer is a little bit messy. Just make sure at the end that you clearly write down what the answer is. Now the marking scheme for uh, question two. So to get the high partial credit in this case here, um, we had to get three out of the four terms to be correct. So if you'd missed the c or if you missed one of these here, then you couldn't get that high credit. And here the high credit is 8, and in order to get that high credit, you'd have to get 3 out of 4 of the steps correct. So if you, you know, get down to this line here where we sub in the 2 and we sub in the 0 and you get to this line, but you just don't do those final steps, you're still going to get 8 marks out of 10. Here the high partial credit is 12, and, you know, in order to do this we need two steps correct so we use you know one and two to get equation number four and we use uh, what well, we use we just find as uh, um, uh, um, 
in, in this case, I did two and three, we did one and three, but it doesn't matter which one you do. But then if you use that to get the next equation, uh, then that would be uh, 12 marks out of 15. So it's 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 worth bearing in, in, in this in mind to uh, to know what you can get uh, awarded a high partial credit for. Okay, so question uh, three is on complex numbers. And, you know, when we do complex numbers, you know, there's important things to remember. Um, the first thing is that, you know, the main difference is this i squared is equal to minus one thing. So they define this number i, which they call the imaginary number, which is the square root of minus one. And what we're going to do is just do our algebra as normal. And then every so often we have to sub in uh, minus one for i squared. Okay. Okay. So we're told that um, z is equal to six plus two i. So I'm just rewriting the question. It's always useful to rewrite the question in my opinion. And now they want us to show that z minus i z is equal to eight minus four i. Okay. So this is the left-hand side of my equation. This is the right-hand side of the equation. We're going to start off with the le left-hand side. We're going to have a bunch of equal signs. And at the very end, we have to end up with the right-hand side. Okay? Okay. So how is that going to work? So the left-hand side. They say z minus iz. But we've been told that z is equal to this thing here. So that's 6 plus 2i minus i times 6 plus 2i. Okay, which is 6 plus 2i minus, now that's i times the 6, which is 6i, and then it's going to be minus uh, i times the 2i, which would be uh, minus 2i squared. Okay, now as I said, you do your algebra as normal, and then what we see here is that this i squared here, we have to replace that with minus 1. So this is going to be 6. Now it's going to be uh, plus 2i, but there's a minus 6i, so these two together give me minus 4i. And then we have the minus 2, but then where we see i squared, we're going to write down minus 1. So that's 6 minus 4i, and then that minus 2 by minus 1 is plus 2, and that's going to be 8 minus 4i, which is equal to uh, that right-hand side. So we're done. Okay, so now they're saying they want to show that z, the mod, modulus of z squared plus i times z squared is equal to z minus i times z squared. Okay, so the first thing to, to note is just say, well, if I have z is equal to a plus bi, then I can plot this on the Aragon diagram. I can get this this uh, this um, point a, b. So remember on the Aragon diagram, this is the real axis, this is the imaginary axis, this is the a, this is the b. And then we have this coordinate a, b here. And then uh, <coughs> um, z, the, th this is the, the modulus of z is just the length of that side there. And we already know from Pythagoras theorem, so this side here would be a, this side would be b. So the modulus of z is then equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. You don't need to know what I did here, but Pythagoras co theorem comes up in many forms. and. You know, if you understand Pythagoras theorem, it comes up in a few different places on the Leibniz course. So it's always good to see it when it when it appears. So the modulus of z is just equal to the square root of a squared plus b squared. Now, um, z for us, what was that? That was z was equal to six plus two i, and they want us to show that the modulus of z squared plus i times z squared is equal to z minus i z the modulus of z minus i z all squared. Well, what we have to do is we have to work out each of these pieces. So the modulus of the z is the modulus of 6 plus 2i, which is the same as 6 squared plus 2 squared, which is the square root of 36 plus 4. And that implies that the modulus of z squared is equal to 40. Now, the modulus of iz squared, so iz is going to be, well, it's going to be 6i plus 2i squared. So what I'm doing is I'm taking this thing above, and I'm multiplying it by i, and I get an i there, and I get an i squared here. So then this becomes, uh, well, this here becomes minus 2, so minus 2 plus 6i. And the modulus of that is then minus 2 squared plus 6 squared, which again is 
the square uh, square root of 4, 4 plus 36, which is the square root of 40, which means the modulus of i squared, i z squared is equal to 40. And that tells us that this one is 40, this one is 40, so this whole side here is equal to, the left-hand side of this equation here is equal to 80. And now the modulus of z minus i z, so that's going to be the modulus of um, 6 plus 2i minus, and iz was equal to this thing, minus 2 plus 6i, which is going to be equal to, well, uh, 6 minus minus 2 is going to be 8, and then plus 2i minus 6i is going to be mi minus 4i, which is the square root of 8 squared plus minus 4 squared, which is the square root of 64 plus 16, which is the square root of 80. And now when I square that, I get 80. And so I see that this has been shown. Now from before I had that z was equal to, z was equal to 6 plus 2i. iz was equal to minus 2 plus 6i. On the argon diagram, this is the point 2, 6. And this is the point, excuse me, that was the point 6, 2. And this is the point minus, minus 2, 6. So I can go over here and I can mark this point here as the point 6, 2. 6 on the x and 6 on the real axis and 2 on the imaginary axis. And then this is minus 2, minus 2, 6, this point here. Okay, so I've just labeled that there successfully. Now I read the question. So the circle passes through these three points, as shown in the diagram. And we're told that this one here and this one here are the end points of a diameter. Okay, um, and now they ask us to work out what the area of the circle is in terms of pi. So let's just quickly go over to this one here and we're just gonna find the formula that we need. So the area of a circle is given by this here, pi or squared, right? So the area of the circle is equal to pi or squared. Now we have, um, so we need to find or, okay? Now we don't have or, or would be like a radius, right? So, um, but if we, what we do is we have these two points are the end points of a diameter. So if we were to find the distance between those two points there and then take that distance and divide by two, we would have the radius, okay? So how do we get the distance between those two points? Well, we're just gonna go down through the, um, until we find the uh, formula that we need for, the distance formula that we need. Uh, which is, sorry, which is here, this one here. So we've got two points here. It's the square root of subtract the x's squared plus subtract the y's squared. So let me write that down there. So the length of the diameter is the square root of x2 minus x1 all squared plus y2 minus y1 all squared. And that's equal to the square root of, and then it's going to be, well, x2, let's um. We just go in and label these things. It doesn't really matter. This is, let's call this x2 and y2, x1 and y1. It doesn't really matter, but just put those labels in. It'll make life a little bit easier. So that's going to be 6 minus, and then it's going to be 6 minus minus 2, 6 plus 2, all squared, plus, and then um, y2 is going to be 2, and then minus uh, 6, all squared, which is going to be equal to the square root of 8 squared, plus minus 4 squared, which is going to be equal to the square root of 64, plus 16, which is equal to the square root of 80. And then the square root of 80 will be equal to, um, will be equal, let's say it's going to be 4 times the square root of 20, the square root of 4 times the square root of 20, which would be 2 times the square root of 20. And then the square root of 20 will be uh, 2 times, and then 2 times the square root of 5. And now that means that the radius is therefore equal to 2 times the square root of 5, because it's half of the diameter, so I have to cancel off that 2. And that means that the area of the circle, then, area of the circle is equal to pi or squared is equal to pi, and then that's 2 root 5 squared, which is the same as 20, so 20 pi. And...
and I was just searching there for units. Sometimes if you write down an area, you have to write, but we weren't given units, so we're going to say uh, square units. Okay, so sorry that I ended up here at the top of the page, but it doesn't really matter once you um, put a box. It doesn't matter where the answer is on the page. Just make it clear so it's clear for the examiner, but in principle, you can put the answer anywhere. Okay, the next question is to work out like uh, this root three minus i all to the power of nine. And what we could potentially do is we could just multiply this thing out like nine times, but it, it, it would take ages, right? So we don't want to do it that. Instead, we want to do it using um, De Marbury's theorem. And this is De Marbury's theorem here. Now I'm just gonna uh, add this in here. Now the first thing uh, is that we don't need to worry about, I don't know why they include that there because you don't do this on, on leave insert, that's like a college thing. And the thing to notice here is that you have this um, to the power of n, okay? Now if you have like a, b to the power of n, well that power, you know, because it's multiplied, you can do them separately. You can put a to the power of n and b to the power of n separately. So that explains why you have or to the power of n. But the weird thing about the Marvis theorem is that n drops in here. Now, why is that? Well, there's a proof that you can show, but this is the nice thing about it. Okay, so what we need to do is we have to take this root three minus i, which is in, at the moment, Cartesian form, okay? And we have to change that into polar form. And then we're gonna be able to apply the, the um, we're gonna be able to apply this De Marvis theorem formula. So what does Cartesian mean? So this is like the xy axis. So this is like an xy point, which would be like root three minus one. And then the polar form is gonna be or and theta. So this question is really about, you know, basically find or and theta and then apply um, the Marvis theorem. So how do we do that? So what I'm gonna do every time I do this question here, I'm just gonna quickly draw an xy axis. Okay, this would be the Argon diagram. So the real axis and an imaginary axis. And what I'm gonna do is, just gonna go all this point here, this is the root three, and then this is the minus one here. So the point is there. And then, okay, let me mark on. So this distance here is gonna be or. And then this angle here is gonna be theta. Now actually what I do is, I'm just gonna take this triangle here out and just draw it by itself over here. Okay, now in this triangle here, this side here is root three, right? Because that's the, this is root three on the, on the axis. Now this is minus one, but in the triangle, we're just gonna call that one. It's a right angle triangle. Um, now this side here is or, okay? So we're after that side there. We could also call it, if this was Z, it would also be called the modulus of Z, but we're calling it or here. And the angle we're after is this one. But for now, I'm gonna think about an angle inside the triangle called alpha. So to get or, it's easy. I just have to use um, Pythagoras theorem. So square root of one side squared plus the other side squared in a square root. So that's the square root of one plus three, which is the square root of four, which is equal to two. So or is equal to two. And then to get this alpha, okay, well, how do I get that? Now, which formulas am I using? So if I go back uh, to the tables again, you see you've got this page here, which is for giving you like the sides and the angles of triangles. But the first section here is for, this is for like triangles without right angles, and this is for triangles with right angles. Okay, so we're here now for this. And this was Pythagoras theorem that we use for one side. So the sine, cos, and tan is what we, we're gonna go for, okay? So what I always do when I'm gonna work with sine, cos, and tan is I write down Sokotoa at the top. So it's sine of theta, well, it'll be alpha in this case. Well, the sine of alpha is the opposite over the hypotenuse, cos of alpha, will be the adjacent over the hypotenuse and tan of alpha. Tan of alpha will be the opposite over the adjacent. Okay, so we can go for any number of things here. How about we use sine? This side here is two, this side here is one, and this angle here is alpha. So for alpha, we can say that sine of alpha is equal to the opposite one over the hypotenuse two. We have to ask ourselves what alpha, and this alpha is less than 90 degrees, which angle gives us that? So we can do inverse sine of one over two, that will give it to us. But we can also, since it's one of the, um, the standard ones, we can also go to this table here. You see, um, if we look at sine here, this is one half, we get a half when the angle is 30 degrees or 
we'll use pi over 6. We'll use the gradient measure, pi over 6. Okay, so this little angle here is pi over 6. So how do we get this big angle here? Well, all we have to do is realize that it's going to be actually this, this angle I'm drawing right now, this is 360 degrees or 2 pi. So it's going to be, theta is going to be equal to 360 degrees. Now I did say radians, didn't I? So 2 pi minus pi over 6. So that's going to be 5 pi over 6. Now if it was here, it would be pi minus alpha. If it was here, it would be pi plus alpha or 180 minus alpha, 180 plus alpha. I use radians because they're just they're a little bit you know they're a little bit um, uh, better to use, but you can use degrees. It's perfectly fine. So theta is equal to pi over six. So I have or equal to two and theta equal to five pi over six. Okay. So now I can say that root three square root three minus i is equal to or two times cos of five pi over six plus i sine pi. So we've done the first part of these types of questions, which is to convert from Cartesian form to polar form. Okay, so the next thing to do is to take this root three uh, minus i to the power of nine and to use Pythagoras term, five pi over six plus i sine of five pi over six to the power of nine. And we end up with, um, well, uh, 2 to the power of 9, I'll work with that now, 2 to the power of 9 is 512. And then this will be cos, and the way this works here is that the 9 sort of parachutes in in front of the 5 pi over 6. And then it's plus i sine, and then again the 9 parachutes in in front of the 5 pi over 6. Okay, so that's going to be 512 and then cos of 45 pi over 6 plus i sine of 45 pi over 6. Now we can just draw that straight into the calculator. So 45 times pi divided by 6. So we figure out what that is and then we take the cosine of that and we get 0. So this is 512 times 0 plus, and then we do the same thing for sine, and we get minus one, and that was times i. So we have minus 512 times i as our answer. Now it might not seem uh, seem so, but this is much shorter than if we were to take this 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 thing to the power of nine and then multiply it out nine times. Okay, so that that just takes a lot longer. I would recommend for every question, every type of question that you do that, imagine if you were allowed to take in, you know, an A4 sheet of paper into the exam and, you know, you could, you know, you could box this page up into a lot of different sections and on each se section you could have a little bit that you could write on each different part, you know, so you'd have a, a section for algebra, a section for complex numbers. So for this section here, you would want to say, okay, we go initially from Cartesian to polar, maybe a couple of these pictures, you know, with, with the thing gone down. Okay, then when we have this here, then we're like, you know, you just drop in the nine or, or these types of things. Like, you, it's much easier to remember these little, like, uh, little kind of um, cues than it is to um, remember entire formulas and stuff, especially if it's in your own writing. Okay, now to have a look at the marking seam for question three. So here there is a high partial credit and you get it basically if you do everything right, but you make a mistake with this I squared, you know, you always have to say I squared. Anytime you see I squared, just put in minus one. You know, that, that's almost the one of the only main things like that in, in complex numbers to remember. So if you, if you made that mistake, you would still, and finish correctly, then you would still get the, um, um, you would still get the high partial credit. And here, the the high partial credit, uh, if you got two out of these, so we had to work out the modulus of z squared, the modulus of i z squared, and the modulus of z minus i z all squared. So if we um, uh, got two of those correct, then we would get the high partial credit. 
And then for this one here, you know, um, if you got the radius, then that radius that we were looking for, then you would get the high partial credit there. Uh, and then in part B, the high partial credit is you have to get three out of these. It's like five steps here, or there's four steps, isn't there? So you have to find or you have to find theta and you have to sub into de Marbury's theorem. So if you got to that point there of finding or and theta and subbing in, then into de Marbury's theorem with the nine, uh, I, don't, I think that you don't even have to bring this, this nine could stay up there as the power, then you, you can still get the high partial credit in that case. Question on sequences and series. So for sequences and series, they may give you the arithmetic sequence, a geometric sequence, or just some sequence that they come up with by themselves. Okay, so if you're given um, the arithmetic sequence, then you have to find the formula for that, uh, which is here it is here. So this is the two formulas that you would need for an arithmetic sequence. It's the three formulas that you need for a geometric sequence to so just be ready with them. But in this case here, we're not told that it's arithmetic or geometric. So uh, that's not going to be helpful to us. Okay. So we're told that the first three terms, uh, a sequence is made up of these terms, u1, u2, u3, and it keeps on going on like that. And there, it's made up of the first one is uh, u1 is equal to 2, and then u2 is equal to 64. And then we're told un plus 1, so this is the next number in the sequence, is made by taking the square root of the previous one, the one just before that, and then the one just before that. Okay, so, so you have to take the two numbers that came before, so you see that's n plus 1, and then what's the number that became, what's the number in the sequence that became before n plus 1? It's n, and the one that became before that is n minus 1. So like, for example, if, if that was, let's say, if you were looking for u4, you would need u3 and u2, or if you were looking for u100, you would need u99 and u98, okay? Now here, they're asking, like, what is u3, and then get it in the form of 2 to the power of p, where p is an element of or. So p isn't like going to be, it might be a whole number, it could be the whole number like 5 or 6, but it could also be like a fraction or, or something like that as well, okay? So we're just going to directly apply the formula, and we're going to take n to be equal to 2. So here's the formula, and directly applying the formula, u3 is equal to the square root of the previous one, u2, divided by the one before that, u1, okay? Which is the square root of 64 divided by 2, which is the square root, well, 64 divided by 2 is equal to 32. And, and now we just have to, you know, there's a page here in uh, our tables here, like, so these are the laws for indices and stuff. The best way to, like, to understand these, to know these, is just to kind of use them uh, a bunch of times, you know. Um, they're mostly straightforward. These ones are a little trickier, but um, uh, just using them and seeing where they come up and kind of learn it that way, I would recommend is the best way. So the first thing is that the square root is, is always like something to the power of a half, right? So instead of writing the square root of 32, I'm going to write 32 to the power of a half. And the other thing I notice is that, well, you know, See, the answer is like they want it to be 2 to the power of something. So I need to get this to 2 to some power, okay? And I see that 32. Well, 32 is the same as it's the same as 2 to the power of 5, okay? And then that's to the power of a half. And now if I have to, a power to a power, then I multiply the power. So that's 2 to the power of 5 over 2, and I'm done. So P is equal to 5 over 2, okay? Okay, the next question. So the first three terms in an arithmetic sequence are as follows. I'm just going to stop straight away and just go to the section where they talk about arithmetic sequences. And I'm just going to copy these two formulas over. Okay, so Tn here, so you know, like when we make a sequence, we're going to have a list of numbers. So the first one for us is 5e to the minus k, uh, 13, 5e to the next. And then it's going to go on and on and on like this. Okay, so this is going to be like, the first number, the second number, the third number in the sequence like that. But instead of saying the first number, actually they say term one, term two, term three. So term n just means like, okay, you know, we would find, let's say n, we want the n to be seven, we would have t7, which would be there, or, or t, you know, t100, which would be up here, right? Something like that. So it's a way to kind of jump uh, up the sequence up to a place where, where you want to go. Remember, sequence is just a list of numbers like this, okay? Um, and the next thing about um, um, the next thing about a, an arithmetic sequence is you always have an a and a d, 
and A is the number that you start with and B is the common difference. So this is the number that you add on to the, pre the, previous, the previous number to get the next number. So like if A was equal to two and B was equal to three, our sequence would, would be two, then plus the three, five, then plus the, the three, eight. And each time we're adding on a three to get these, these numbers in a sequence. So we need to look at this sequence here and immediately we can say, well, a must be whatever the first one is, right? So that's, you know, it doesn't look like, it looks a bit weird, but it's just the first, it's just the first term in the sequence. That's what the A is. Now D is harder to get, but what we see is D is equal to, well, there's two different ways to get it, isn't there? Like if we were to look over here, you know, we can see that D is a jump of three. Now, how do we get that jump? We say five minus two, that's how we get the jump of three. But we could also get it from here, eight minus five, or from here, 11 minus here, or, or 14 minus 11. So you can always get it from the, the, the gap between, um, between, between, uh, two, between um, w one term and, and the next. So I can say D is equal to, well, it's, it's equal to the gap between these two, right? Which would be 13 minus five E to the minus K, but it's also equal to the gap between these two, which is five E to the K, um, five E to the K minus 13. OK, and then and this happens all the time, all the time. Uh, we have now got an equation, you see. If you just know, don't look at anything else in the entire page. We, we have an equation, you see, for those two there. OK, so that's what we're going to start with. So let's have a read of the question now. So it says uh, these are the terms. Uh, these are the terms in the sequence. And it says by letting y equal e to the k show that 5y squared minus 26y plus 5 is equal to 0. So y is now equal to e to the k. But let me have a look at this now. This is 13 minus e to the minus k. Now, if, if we just stop for a moment and say, well, e to the minus k, anytime we see the minus up in the power, right, it's one over that, OK? So instead of saying, um, so instead of saying um, uh, 13 minus 5 e to the minus k, I'm going to say 5 over e to the k. And that's equal to 5e to the k minus 13. But they said that 13 minus 5 over uh, e to the k equal to 5e to the k. Sorry. They said that we want to make that substitution. So what I'm going to do is everywhere I find this e to the k, I'm going to substitute that with y. And so now I have this equation here. Okay, so now this might not look like it, but this is actually a quadratic. Anytime you see like this, one of the variables hiding below the line, see what we can do is we can multiply both sides by y. Why do we want to do that? Because that y will cancel with that y. And what we'll end up with is 13y here minus 5, because they cancel, is equal to 5y squared minus 13y. And now I'm going to bring uh, this, this stuff over to the other side, and I'll end up with 5y squared minus 13y minus 13y plus 5, and that's equal to 0. And I should have an implies here. And that's 5y squared minus 26y plus 5 is equal to 0. Now let me check if that was, yeah, 5y squared minus 26y plus, plus 5 is equal to 0. That's correct. Then it says, use the equation in part y above, sorry, use the equation in y in part b to find the two possible values of k. Okay. So part, by doing this, you know, this substitution, we ended up getting this quadratic equation, which was 5y squared minus 26y plus 5 is equal to 0. Now, if we solve this quadratic equation, then we can get two values for y, and then we can use those two values uh, for y to get the, the, because y was equal to e to the k, right? So we'll be able to get um, k out if we have y. So let's get y first. So we could use the quadratic formula here, but actually, um, you know, if we look at this, well, first of all, it's 5y and y, right? Because we, we can't get 5y squared um, without 
uh, we need to multiply 5y by y. And then the question is, okay, well, this has to be 1 by 5, this one over here. And the question is, well, is there a way to get a minus 26? Well, okay, we could put a 5 here and a 1 here, you see, and then that would be 5 by 5 would be 25, and 1 by 1, y would be 1. So we have 25 and 1, so we can get 26. But we need a minus y, and how do we get that? Well, if these are both minus. And so we have y is equal to 1 over 5, or y is equal to 5. Now, if we remember from before that y was equal to e to the k, so that means that e to the k is equal to 1 over 5, and e to, or e to the k is equal to 5. Okay, so now how do we get k? And if we look here at this page here, so we have a column here for indices, we have a column for logs, and then we have this column, which is a kind of a link between indices and logs. And the most important equation uh, in that column is this first one at the top. So let me just take that one over here. And so what it tells you, you see, if we're if we're after something that is up in a power, which we are, we're after this k, we have to take the log of both sides. You see, if we take the log and we every time you take a log, you take the log to 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 the to a base number. Um and what base number? Well we take a log to the base of this a here. So we take log to the base e of e to the k is equal to log to the base e of 1 over 5 from, from the first one. But of course, if you take this thing here, well, they actually, if you, uh, as soon as you do that, if you know your laws for logs, then they actually uh, cancel out. And you're just left with the k here is equal to, so that's the, see, the x is the number that's up in the power, but once you do this step here, the x is down out of the power on the bottom line, and then on the other side, you just have log to the base a, or whatever was on the, the right-hand side, side. So that's log to the base, log to the base e of 1 fifth, and then this one would be k is log to the base e of 5. Now, of course, log to the base e, another way to say that is just natural log. It's, 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 it's just because log to the base e comes up so often in different areas in mathematics, we just give it a special ln just because it saves like a fraction of a second to write ln instead of log to the base e every time. So that's, um, so these are, and they're, they're also telling us, uh, oh, sorry, and then um, this is uh, ln of uh, 1 over 5. If we look at our laws for, for logs, see if you have ln of 1 over 5, it's ln of, uh, of uh, the top thing minus ln of the bottom thing. So this is ln of 1 minus ln of 5. And then ln of 1, if we have a look over here as well, and ln of any log of 1 is always going to be 0. So that's 0 minus ln of 5. So we have minus ln of 5. So this one is minus ln of 5, this one here. And the other one is ln of 5. So that now, you always want to have, a, uh, you know, they'll say they want the answer in a particular form. And if you don't get it right there, you can lose a mark or two. Marking seem for question four. So in the first one, we had uh, a high partial credit of seven. And basically, if we got two steps correct, so if we said u3 was equal to the square root of u2 over u1, and then sub them in, then that will be enough to get seven marks out of 10. And then in this one here, uh, the high partial credit uh, if we get two steps correct. So in order to do this, we had to get this equation, first of all, and then we had to sub in for um, the e to the k is equal to y. So this, you know, e to the minus k is 1 over e to the k, so that'll be 1 over y. So if we got those two, then we would get 7 marks out of 10. And then for the next part, high partial credit of 8, and we get that if we get two steps correct, so, you know, uh, basically factorizing the quadratic equation uh, and getting five or five or one fifth, just doing that, that amount and nothing more is enough to get you eight marks out of 10, which is good to know. Get um, the derivative of this function here. And um, uh, before I do that, I'm just going to get this page up here. So 
this is um, uh, uh, this column here will show us the um, derivative of a bunch of sort of simple functions, and then we have more complicated cases on the right here. And the one that we're going to be using is this this one here. Now, one one thing to note here is that uh, you know we always want to have this as like x to some power, but this second term here, this minus one over x, is is not in a good form. So I'm going to say that g of x is equal to x squared. And instead of minus like 1 over x, I'm going to write that 1 over x as x to the power of minus 1. Now, why am I going to do that? Well, because if I have x to the power of n, as soon as I differentiate that, it's nx to the power of n minus 1. So I always sort of want it as x to some power. So now it's x to some power. And I can just do g prime of x now uh, is equal to, well, uh, 2x, and then minus, and then minus 1 comes down, and then x, and then that's to the power of minus 2. And I'm just going to tidy up, so 2x. That's going to be a plus, and then it's x to the power of minus two, but then that's the same as a two x uh, plus one over x squared, and now that's enough. Okay, so the next part um, here. So one thing to note is that this is a question that started off being about uh, differentiation, and now all of a sudden we've got this algebra part. And what's going to happen is that it'll be an algebra question, but then in the next part, we're going to have to do this like derivative over here. OK, so you can expect them to be a little bit mixed up for there to be an algebra question mixed in with the calculus question. They always they, they tend to mix it up a bit. OK, OK, so we're given that X plus one is a factor of F of X. OK, and we know with these kinds of questions here that you're going to be able to write F of X down as a product of three factors. And if we set that equal to zero, well, one of these is going to be X plus one. And we're going to have X is equal to minus one as a root. And then they, we can get the roots of the other two from, from all of that. OK. So this is the approach that we're going to take here. And if we have already that um, x plus 1 is a factor of that um, cubic there, then we can do this long division to find the other two factors. So I'm just going to write that down like this, plus 40x plus 63. Now, like one of the keys would just be, you know, like the secret to success with this stuff would just be to, you know, do these questions like so often that like it's sort of becomes kind of like a muscle memory at that point, right? So um, the next thing um, to do is to, um, we have to write a number down here that's going to multiply here to give us a 2x cubed here on the bottom, okay? So what number that is that going to be? Well, that's going to be 2x squared. So 2x squared multiplies by x to give me 2x cubed, and it multiplies here, sorry, it multiplies by that one then, to give um, 2x cubed to give a plus 2x squared. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the signs. So change them both to minus. And I'm going to then add. Okay, so they cancel. That's the whole point there. And then this is going to be minus 23x squared. And then I just copy down the other two that are already there. Okay, so this is the next level. So we just repeat this now. So the number that goes here. That multiplies here to give me a minus 23x squared. What's that going to be? That's going to be, um, uh, it's going to be minus 23x. So that would be minus 23x, but it also multiplies by the 1 to give me a minus 23x here. And then what do I do? Well, I change the signs, make this a plus, make this a plus. So change the signs, don't make them negative, change them. They cancel. That's zero, and this gives me 63x, and I have that plus 63 is carried over. And now I'm going to say, okay, what number do I put here so that when I multiply it by the x that I get a 63x down here? So you see the step of stairs stuff that's going on, right? So you want to, so what number is that going to be? Well, that's going to be um, plus 63. So the 63 multiplies by the x to give me 63 x and it multiplies by the 1 to give me plus 63. That's great because now when I change the signs, then they cancel and they give me 0 and 0. So it goes unevenly. So this is the correct answer. So this is the one of the factors and this is the, the other factor. But now we have to take this. Now just, just as a quick, uh, let's say I have like 2 by 3 by 4, right? So that's going to be, you know, 6 by 4 is going to be uh, 24. So I could start with 24 and I can say, well, that's 2 by 12. But then I can take the 12 and say that's 2 by uh, 3 by 4. And then I can go even further if I want to. 
So, you know, we're not done with our factorizing. Now we have to factorize this piece here as well. So let me just take that there. So that's going to be 2x squared minus 23x plus 63. And I put brackets and brackets. Okay. So then this is, sorry, uh, this is uh, 2x and x. And well, two numbers that multiply. You know, I might, I'd be tempted to use the quadratic formula, but I might get away with this here. Let's have a look. So 1 times 63. So incidentally, this, this has to be 2x and x, because the only way that we can get 2x squared is with 2x and x. But 63, we can get as 1 times 63. We can get 3 times 21, or we can get 6 times, um, uh, sorry, 9 times 7 as well. So these are the these are the three ways that we can get there. So let's just go through the different possibilities. So if I put a 63 here and a 1 here, there's no way I can get that one. So that one's out. If I put a 21 here and a 3 here, I can't get that, that 63. If I put the 3 here and the 21 here, I can't get the 23 either. So if I now put the 9 here and the 7 here, so two 9s would be 18. And then plus a seven, that doesn't work either. But if I put the seven here and the nine here, that would be two times seven would be 14. And then the nine will be, nine plus 14 will be 23. So a seven and nine will work, but now I have to look at the uh, at the signs. So I need a plus here. So they have to have the same sign here and here, but then I need it to be a minus. So it's gonna be minus and minus. Okay, so that gives me X plus one was my first factor, two X, minus 9 is my second factor, x minus 7 is my third factor. I set them all equal to 0, and then I get x is equal to minus 1 is my first root, uh, x is equal to 9 over 2 is my second root, and x is equal to 7 is my, is my third root. They're the three values. They're the three values of x that will give us f of x is equal to 0. Okay, and now it says find the range of values for which f prime of x is negative and correct and, and get this correct to two decimal places. Okay, so I'm gonna guess I'm gonna need f of x, so I'm just gonna copy it across. And the question is asking us about f prime of x. So we have f of x, so we're gonna need f prime of x. So let's just do that first of all. So that's going to be 2 times 3x squared minus 21 times 2x and then plus 40. So that's going to be 6x squared minus 42x uh, plus 40. And we want to find out when this is going to be less than 0. So we have to solve this quadratic inequality. And when we do this quadratic inequality, when you solve a quadratic inequality, the first thing you want to do is you want to turn it into an equation. So you make it into, let's say, turn into equation. And then the second thing you want to do is you want to find the roots of that equation. Then you want to plot, plot it. And then you just look at it. Okay. So first of all, I'll turn this into an equation. That's going to be 6x squared minus uh, 42x plus 40 is equal to 0. Now I'm going to divide across by 2. Make it a bit simpler. And then I'm going to use the quadratic formula. So it's going to be x is equal to minus b, which will be 21, uh, plus or minus the square root of minus 21 squared, minus 4 times 3 times 20, all over 2 times a, which will be 2 times 6, which will be like that. And then you figure that out and you get these two values x is equal to 1.137 or. 5.862. So that's the first one. We turn into equations, or the first two complete, we turn it into an equation, and then we get the roots. And the next thing we want to do is we want to plot it. Okay. So I have this 1.14, uh, because it said two different decimal places, right? And I have this 5.86, and that's a U shape graph that goes through those two points. So the question is, where is that less than zero? Well, it's less than zero when it's underneath the x axis. So you see that piece there. That's where the thing is less than zero, okay? And what we have to do is we have to say, well, this is the x value that it, it corresponds to that portion there, that the part of f, f prime of x that's less than zero,
corresponds to this piece of the x-axis, which means x is greater than 1.14 and x is less than 5.86. And you could write that as like 1. 1.14 is uh, less than x is less than 5.86. And that's the range of values for which f prime of x is negative. Now at the marking scheme for question 5, um, so for uh, a part A, there's no high partial credit. For part B, there's a high partial credit of 12. And you get that if you get three steps correct. And that means from here, we look here that you have to get, um, you know, basically find the three solutions or, or get up to the point where you factorize that uh, quadratic that you got out. So you have to get down to uh, either this line or, or somehow get to that line here uh, without having done the previous step. And then for part two, there's a high partial credit of eight. And in order to get that, you need to get three um, steps correct, which means basically getting up to the point of finding the roots. Or if you got the wrong roots, but you you then got, um, you wrote down the range correctly, then you would also get high partial credit. Okay, question six, part A, uh, we have to do differentiation from first principles. That a differentiation from first principles formula is one of the only formulas on the leaving cert that we're not uh, given. Okay, so we're going to have to remember that one going in. Um, however, uh, if you look at the formula, you always look at the pieces of the formula. So this is like a piece of the formula. This is a piece of the formula, and this is a piece of the formula here. Okay, so f of x is equal to 2x squared plus 4x. We're going to need that piece. Another piece is f of x plus h. So we're going to have to work out what f of x plus h is. And what f of x plus h is, basically everywhere we see x, we just replace it by f of x. We replace it by x plus h, you see. You just do this direct substitution. Just don't think too much. You just sort of whatever goes in here, whatever is in here, uh, just goes straight into wherever x is. Okay. So now this is going to be 2 times x squared plus 2xh plus h squared plus 4x plus 4h. And then that turns into 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared plus 4x plus 4h. Okay. And now f prime of x is going to be equal to the limit as h goes to 0 of it's going to be one what's awkward about this is just how, how big along the fraction is i'm just going to save myself a little bit of time just by copying that piece um bring it down so it's going to be that whole thing there and then it's going to be minus and then it's going to be 2x squared plus 4x okay and um okay so the way this question works is if we look at the top line of that fraction there, there's going to be some terms, like these terms, that don't have h's in them, okay? And then there's going to be another bunch of terms that do have h's in them, okay? And what's going to happen is that all the terms that have h's in them are going to cancel. So that 2x squared will cancel with this minus 2x squared, and this 4x will cancel with this 4x. And then you see of everything that's left is, has got a h in it, you see? And what happens is that this h on the bottom line will count. That's the way that these always work. So this has to happen or else you've, you've gone wrong. So now I'm going to cancel this h with that h there, this h here, one power of h here, this h here with this h here. And then what I have is that this line here becomes the limit as h tends to 0 of 4x plus 2h plus 4. And when you work out these limit, you know, what, what's going on with limits is a little bit, um, uh, you know, subtle what's happening with limits. But working out limit questions, you just, it's not subtle. You just, we're just going to put in the value of zero in here. Right? We're just going to sub it in. So we end up getting 4x plus 2 times zero, which is just zero, plus 4. And that's our answer, okay? Now, the nice thing about, you know, questions about differentiating from first principles is that we can just actually you know, just differentiate the function normally and we would get 4x plus 4. So we know that we're correct, okay? Now, you could say, why not? Why, why go through all the trouble? And the point is that this, um, you know, this page of rules that we have here 
have been sort of painstakingly worked out from first principles then we get this page here and but it all this is you know from first principles is 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 um how you you got get these rules in, in the first place okay and now we have a question about some rectangle that's expanding an area and the width of the rectangle is such and such. Now, the first thing you're going to want to do here is you're just going to want to draw yourself a diagram. Like we're, we're essentially missing a diagram in this question. So we just have to, let's, let's just do what they say. Okay, so it's a rectangle. Okay, so I'm going to draw a rectangle. Okay, here's my rectangle. I decided to draw it like, a, like this. And they've said that the width of the rectangle is X and the length of the rectangle is four times x so that's why i decided to make it like a you know a tall rectangle instead of um one on its side <clears throat> okay so they're saying uh, find the rate of change of the area of the rectangle with respect to its width x when the area of the rectangle is 225 centimeters squared so that's a little bit of a, a sort of a tricky sentence to sort of take apart and um, possibly okay so the first thing i'm going to do is i'm going to work out what the area is so this is a rectangle so the area is the length by the width okay so that's 4x by x which is just 4x squared and the rate of change of the area of the triangle of the rectangle with respect to its width you know we always have to expect that it's going to be like the adx okay because it's a differentiation question Whatever you have on the left-hand side, when you differentiate it with respect to the variable, uh, so the, the variable that you see on the, on the left-hand side, so that's 4x squared is the right-hand side. So when we differentiate that, we get 8x. Okay. And they say they want us to find out what, find the rate. So they want us to find the ADX when the area is equal to 225. Now, the area is equal to 4x squared. And if 4x squared is equal to 225, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the square root of both sides. So then 2x would be equal to, and I'll just quickly get the square root of 225. So 225 and the square root is 15. So that means that x is equal to 15 over 2, which is 9.5. So when this is um when this is 9.5 then the area is equal to two, 225, okay? And what we're gonna do with this x is equal to 9.5 is we're gonna sub it in here. So the ADX then is equal to eight times 9.5. So then uh, eight times 9.5 is equal to uh, 60. Okay, this is the last question of section A on the exam paper. Um, okay, so what we're, they're kind of asking us to do here is they give us um, a function like, and they add, this is the plot of the function, but then they want us to now plot its derivative, okay? And its derivative doesn't exactly look like this. It, its derivative will look a little bit um, kind of different. Now, just one thing to note here as well is that this graph here has got two different bumps. And that basically means that it's a cubic. And if you if we differentiate a cubic, we, we would get a quadratic. So we can expect the other one to have a sort of a quadratic sort of shape, okay? But um, we're gonna have to read through the question and sort of like look carefully at the diagram and then kind of piece together the answer. Okay. So the graph of a cubic function, so this is a cube, P of X is a cubic function. So like it could be like AX cubed plus BX squared plus CX plus D, okay? Uh, it's shown uh, in the region of 0 to 4. And they say the maximum value of P prime of X, so the max value of P prime of X is 1. So the maximum value of P prime of X is 1. So that's not the max value of P of X. It's the max maximum slope of P of X. That's probably happening around here, right? That's, that's the steepest that that curve gets in the upward direction, right? We're told that P prime of zero is equal to minus three. And where P prime is the derivative of P of X. And it says, use this information to draw the graph of P prime of X. Okay. 
So what do we know? We know p this is going to be the graph of p prime of zero. So we're given, first of all, we're given a point. When this is when x is zero, p prime of zero is equal to minus three. So this gives us the point zero and minus three. So this one starts at zero and minus three. And what we see is that we see um, that the slopes are all negative. You see this portion of the curve here, the slopes are all negative up to this point. And here it's flat and here it's flat, okay? Now flat means P prime of X, it means the slope is zero, P prime of X is equal to zero. So this is zero, P prime of X is equal to zero and this is P prime of X. So we're gonna start here, we're gonna go through those two points. And then the maximum, the maximum slope is equal to one. And, you know, this is just, it's just, a, we want to draw a graph. So, you know, we, we, we don't have to be, we just want to make a sketch, right? So we don't have to calculate anything here because we weren't given these values here. But basically, you know, the maximum of this thing here happens halfway in between those two. So this is what this one looks like here. It looks like this. And then after three, then it's going, it's going down again like that. And that's it. So now looking at the marking scheme for question six. So uh, we have a high partial credit of 12 for 6a, and we get this for getting uh, three steps correct. So what are the steps? You know, get f of x plus h, subtract f of x plus h minus, and then find uh, this thing here, which basically means subtracting, means getting this third line here and not getting this last bit here would get us the high partial credit. Here uh, there's a high partial credit of um, eight, and we get this if we get three steps correct. So that would mean getting, writing down the area in terms of X, finding the, uh, the length of the side equal to 15 over 12, and then finding the derivative or we evaluate so three out of those four but probably would mean getting to the point of writing this 8x down but also finding a 15 over 12 so that's our eight that's our high partial credit there okay thanks for watching my video i'm going to follow this up with a video on section b and on previous years